Hello class, in this new and final unit for this class, we'll be starting off with talking about, um, well, sorry, in this unit we'll be discussing the function of interior space. This is probably, um, I feel like one of the most important units uh, that we talk about in interior design is it kind of sets you up on how to be able to put everything together. We've gone through all of the elements and principles of design, we've gone through the interior design styles, we've gone through the different types of um, design and things like that. So now we kind of finished off with how do we put it together? How does your interior function? Does it make sense? Is it um, livable, sensible, functional? When you put your space together, simply put, does it work? And that's kind of what we're going to be discussing in this um, unit. You'll learn about um, furniture arrangement, living zones, um, different living spaces and how to floor plan and those types of things which I feel like is a very beneficial portion of interior design I think this part will take you far into interior design if this is something that you enjoy so um, if you have not gotten it yet make sure you grab your unit 5 note guide um, for this uh, new unit and you'll be filling out your notes as we go through this lesson so In this unit, and I mean, sorry, in today's lesson, we'll be discussing discussing the different living zones within your space. Now, um, those living zones, um, there are three, and you have a living slash social zone, a sleeping slash private zone, and a service slash work zone. It does not matter what size of space you have, you will have these three zones. If you have a 7,000 square foot mansion, you're going to have these three zones. If you have a 300 square foot studio apartment, you're going to have these three zones. Obviously, if you have a 300 square foot studio apartment, these three zones are going to be very minimal and very small and probably very tight uh, together. If you have a 7,000 square foot home, then you're obviously going to have very large versions of these spaces and you may have multiple versions of these spaces. But no matter what home you have or what living area you have, you are going to have these three zones. So let's go over um, how we break up these zones and what rooms belong in each. So um, I want you guys to think to yourself for a moment, what do you think the living areas are in your home? What areas would you consider um, the living area, the living zones in your home? I'll give you a second to think about some and then I'll tell you what they are. Our first one is going to be your living room. That one's kind of an easy, obvious one. Next one is going to be your dining room. Next one is going to be your family room, which could also be a living room. It just kind of depends on what your space is. Um, a game room, a great room, entryways, porches. These are going to be your living slash social zones. Basically, I want you to think about any area in your home that you would socialize in. Do you socialize in your living room? Do you do living in your living room? Yes. Dining room is a very large social area. That's where you usually eat your family meals and or have dinner parties. Family room and great rooms also where you socialize. A game room where you would socialize with groups of people. The reason your entryways are on there is because if you think about the fact that you are going to have anyone who comes to your home even just for a quick visit, they are going to be stopping in your entryway and that's probably where you're going to have some conversations especially if it's just a quick drop by of someone dropping something off or coming to say hi and they may not be coming in for a while they may sit and talk to you in your entryway and then your um, porches because obviously when weather is nice you may be sitting out on patios and porches and socializing that way what is the purpose of your living slash social areas in your home we kind of just talked about it it is to um, they're used for activities and entertainment um, like games hobbies, TV viewing, parties, eating, conversation, um, active play. So let's talk about furniture arrangement within these rooms, within these areas. Um, basically what they, um, what I'm gonna ask you in the next series of questions is kind of square footage and certain inches and feet and things like that, uh, depending on what I, how I ask it to you. Um, these are numbers that you do want to know and memorize, so you will be writing these down and then you'll want to remember what they are. So um, this is asking you what the ideal diameter for a primary conversation is. 
of conversation area is. How big do you need this space um, minimum? Like I said, it can be bigger. This is the minimum space required for a primary conversation area. And the answer is eight to 12 feet. Here, I just want to show you a picture of a really cool patio, lots of different areas where you can socialize. You've got your barbecue area with some chairs and seating. You have the couch area where you can include a lot of people, and then you also have the dining area. You've got a lot of different spaces in this um, on this patio where you can um, socialize. Let's talk about secondary furniture for a moment. Um, when I say the word secondary, what this means is it's not your primary furniture. Primary furniture is furniture that is basically kind of required in that space. To have this space function, you must have this furniture. So like as an example, in a bedroom, a primary piece of furniture would be your bed. In a living room, your primary piece of furniture would be your, um, would be your uh, couch. And then like in a dining room, the primary piece of furniture would be a dining table. Secondary furniture is going to be less, um, less important furniture, but that kind of completes and fills up the space. So in a bedroom, it could be your nightstands, a foot bench, ottomans, um, maybe some dressers, some shelving, things like that. That's going to be secondary furniture for a bedroom. In a living room, it could be a desk, an ottoman, a love seat for one to two people, maybe even a piano. In a dining room, it would be uh, maybe like a hutch or a buffet. So secondary furniture is furniture that is not necessarily required to make the space function, but it completes your space and gives you multiple details to look at. Um, so examples would be seating for two to three people, a piano, a desk, a chair for one person, um, etc. Now I want you guys to think how many, how many square feet, and if you, you get your square feet by timesing your uh, length by your width of the room. Uh, so you take the width of the room and you times that number by the width of your room and that's going to be your square footage. So how many square feet do you think you need minimally for a dining room to fit four people? So not a very large space. A four person dining room is going to be relatively small. How many square footage do you need to be able to pull this off comfortably? Think about that for a second and I'll give you the answer. The answer is at least 80 square feet. Remember, you can have it be a little bit larger, but you definitely don't want it to be smaller than 80 square feet. You want to be able to have enough space to fit a dining table that seats four people comfortably with four chairs that you can easily scoot in and scoot out. So how big do you think a dining room should be to require a table that sits four to eight people um, and then also be able to place a hutch and a buffet in that room? A hutch is going to be a cabinet that holds your um, china and tablecloths and things like that. A buffet is a shorter, longer cabinet that what you do is you can use it to store uh, china and uh, linens as well, but you can also clear off the top and place your food on top and then serve your dinner buffet style. And that's why it's called a buffet. So how, bit, how many square footage minimum do you think this room should be? Think about it for a second and I'll give you the answer. It's going to be 180 square feet minimum. Again, you can have it be a little bit bigger, but you definitely want to have at least 180 square feet to be able to pull this off. I just want to show you some different pictures of living room, I mean of dining rooms, because I love dining rooms and I think they're beautiful. Here's just some different styles. Uh, remember that a furniture for your living slash family room should be durably and easily maintained furniture. The reason for this is because this is the furniture that's going to be used the most often by the most people. So you definitely want furniture that's easy to maintain and keep and keep very clean. This is why a lot of people will go the leather route because leather is really easily wiped down. Um, usually like animal hair doesn't stick to it. Kids stickiness can be wiped off pretty easily so on and so forth. If you do choose to go the upholstered route, just make sure maybe you get like a stain guard put on it or you um, have it cleaned regularly by like a professional cleaner or whatnot to be able to keep your furniture um, looking the best that it can. Now let's talk about the sleeping slash private areas of your home. Which areas of your home are used for sleeping slash private? Think about it for a moment and I'll give you, and then I'll give you the answer for those rooms. One is going to be your bedroom, obviously, next bathroom, and then your closets. 
And then if you're real fancy and you have these in addition, dressing rooms are going to be your sleeping slash private areas of your home. These are spaces you keep private. So what are the purposes of the sleeping slash private areas of your home? I mean, it's kind of obvious. It says it in the name, but it is for sleeping, bathing, and dressing. And so you obviously want privacy for these um, activities that take place in these rooms. What are the three types of space that should be provided to somebody in their bedroom? I want you to think about it. Whatever size of bedroom you have, whatever kind of bedroom you have, whatever your style is, what three spaces do you want to be able to be able to do in that bedroom? Think about it for a second. I'll give you your answers. You're definitely going to want a place to sleep, a place for storage, and a place to dress. This is where you're, you want these three spaces in any given bedroom. The smaller the bedroom, the smaller the spaces and the smaller these areas. The larger the bedroom, the larger these areas. Um, how much space should be left on each side of your bed? Um, you want at least 22 inches so that you can walk around it while making the bed. Um, this is not very big, this is less than two feet. It's just enough space to be able to walk around that bed till you can be able to um, make it comfortably. What a lot of people do is they will put larger beds, like um, anything over it larger than a twin, They'll put it up against a wall to save space, which I mean, I understand the idea there, but it's not really, it just makes it very difficult to make that bed and it's kind of like an interior design no-no. So if you have a bed that's larger than a twin and it's up against a wall to like create more space, I mean, I get what you're doing, but it will look better in the middle of your room and it makes it easier to make because you can walk around it. The reason a twin bed is an exception is because normally if you do have a twin size bed, you're probably sharing a room um, very rarely do you have a twin size bed in a room that is um, uh, your own and then also when you become an adult if you have an adult if you are an adult and you still sleep in a twin size bed it's time to make that choice <laughs> it's time to make that upgrade get an adult size bed and um, but twin beds are skinny enough that you can make them from one side and usually since they're shared rooms you usually have a twin side bed a twin size bed on each wall um, when you're thinking about your closet where and like where you're placing like your bed or like footstool or dresser and things like that, you want to be able to have enough space in front of your closet to be able to um, like open doors, walk in front of, be able to get dressed and things like that. And so you want at least 33 inches of space to be able to get dressed and be able to walk in front of your closet. Um, how big of a diameter do you need to be able to get dressed comfortably? And that's 42 inches. Now, talking in closets, I just want to kind of show you some celebrity closets to remind us where we sit on the tax bracket and <laughs> the kind of closets that we will probably never own unless we become very, very successful people. I just want to kind of show you some. Aren't these amazing? And this one has a phone. If you spend so much time in your closet because it's so big, you have a phone that probably has an intercom system. Here's some two-story closets for those of people who are really fancy. And then the last area we're going to talk about is our work slash service areas of your home. What areas of your home do you think would fall into this category? Think about it for a second and then we'll move forward. A kitchen is going to be in the work slash service area of your home. A garage and an office and then your utility slash laundry room. These are the rooms that are going to fall into the work slash service areas of your home. What are the purposes of the work slash service areas of your home? I know these answers are pretty easy because they're in the name of the zone. It's for cooking, cleaning, chores of any kind, and your work slash career. These are the purpose of those areas in your home. When you are thinking about your work slash service areas of your home, they should have easy access from the entry of your home to other parts of the home because you're going to be using these um, pretty frequently. Now, if you own the home, and this is your personal home, and you're the adult that lives in this home, you're most likely going to be parking in the garage and coming in through the garage door instead of the front door. Um, and so when you walk in, you want to be able to walk into your laundry slash mudroom almost immediately because that's going to be probably where you like hang your coats up, your bags, um, maybe take your shoes off, keys, things like that, because that's kind of the room that you use that for. So you want that to be right by the entry of the home because it makes it easy and keeps your stuff organized. 
you want your laundry room to be close to your kitchen because of um, the laundry that accumulates in a kitchen from like rags, dish towels, things like that. And then you obviously want your garage close to these two rooms because that's where you're going to be coming and going and like carrying in groceries, things like that. And then also a lot of people will keep um, stuff in their garage for their kitchen, like extra storage, food storage, um, canned foods, even maybe like an extra fridge or freezer and a deep freezer. And so you want that close to your kitchen just for functionality and making life easy. Um, you want to be able to put these areas close to each other because it just makes sense. Your home office doesn't necessarily have to be close to these areas, but it, I mean, it can be. If you look at this floor plan, it is. It makes it really easy to go from your work slash career to your kitchen, to a bathroom, to your laundry room, to a garage. It's all in one area of the home and it just makes sense. Um, the only exception to this rule is if you live in a two-story home and your um, all of your bedrooms are on the second floor, then you may want to have your laundry room on the second floor because if you do, um, your bedrooms are going to accumulate way more laundry than your kitchen does. And so um, because of that, you may want to be able to, um, you may want to put your laundry room where your bedrooms are because it's going to accumulate more laundry. But if you live on a main floor and you have some bedrooms on a main floor, some in the basement, some on upstairs or whatever, I would keep your laundry room close to your kitchen. Here are just some different examples of kitchens. Here are some different laundry rooms. Here are some different home offices. And here are some different garages. Here's a really fun garage. <laughs> Shows you exactly where to park your car, which is nice. And then here is your assignment. So if you have not picked this up yet, make sure you grab the living zone assignment. It's um, a white piece of paper and it's got questions on the front and then it's got a blank floor plan on the back. What you're going to be doing with this project is you are going to be coloring each of the zones. So um, you are going to color all of your living slash social areas yellow. You're gonna color all of the sleeping slash private areas red and then you're gonna color all the work slash service areas blue. Um, and then you don't have to color any hallways, just keep that in mind. Um, and then, uh, so yellow, red, and blue is what you're going to be using. Just get those three colors from the front of the room. And um, you don't have to color the hallways, like I said. And then you will not be able to answer the questions on page one until we've done traffic patterns and furniture arrangement. So after, you, um, after we've done that lesson, the traffic patterns and furniture arrangement, you can go back and answer the questions on page one. Um, and then that's your assignment for this lesson. And that is Living Zones.